So I said, I don't want to be a chairman anywhere. You know, I don't need that aggravation of all that administration. They go, no, 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 this isn't it. They go, well, I don't want to take over someone's existing center because it's, um, you know, I have to change the culture and that's no fun. They go, no, that's not it. So I go, what is it? It says it's to be a founding director of a neurodegenerative disease center that just, by the way, has a $25 million endowment. So now they got my attention. And I tell you, I came to visit Arizona and I was stunned on how fabulous the science is in, uh, in Arizona, both in Phoenix and Tempe. And that really changed my mind. And I decided that I wanted to pursue this job. It's my dream job. It's exactly, if you said to me before I got the phone call, well, how do you, would you define your dream job? That would be how I define my dream job. So now I had just one other issue I had to deal with. I had gotten remarried about a year before. And so I went to my wife. I said, Janet, I think I really want this job. I, I'm not going without you. And she says to me, darling, when I fell in love with you, I thought I was going to be stuck in Chicago for the rest of my life. Says, I want to go somewhere warm. And last time I looked, Arizona is warm. So I can just tell you that I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I love speaking to, to patients. And I know patients appreciate when I give these lectures. But I got to tell you something. Um, I learned so much from interacting with the patients. And I always tell my students that you can't really understand Parkinson's disease unless you speak with patients and go shadow physicians. And so, um, uh, again, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I'm going to get ready to show my slides. I'm going to talk about cell and gene therapy. Um, Parkinson's disease, I'm, I'm not going to talk about Huntington's disease today, although I could. Um, but, uh, you know, so the, are, are we near a cure? So I'm going to give you the answer right now, okay? Then I'll backtrack and show you the data and everything. First of all, with stem cells, it will never be a cure because it's not designed to be a cure. Dopaminergic stem cells are designed to give you more neuronal-like delivery of the transmitter that you've lost in Parkinson's, namely dopamine. And so all the things that levodopa can do, stem cells will be able to do. So you'll have much better motor control, but you won't have these disabling dyskinesias because you'll have more cells there to process the levodopa. So that's really good. And I'm going to show you a video to illustrate that point in terms of levodopa in just a minute. Um, gene therapy has a greater chance of, I don't like the word cure. What I like is the word disease modifying. So we can prevent you from getting worse. So but the, some of the gene therapies I'm going to talk to you about can be disease modifying. And we're still at the beginning of this process, but um, I have confidence that this will um, uh, this will get better as we go along. I got a lot of slides in my slide deck. I actually put, there's something we just published this week that I think is a game changer for Parkinson's disease. I'm going to try and get through that. It's a little more dense than some of the other stuff that I'm going to talk to you about today. But um, I think it's important for you to know. Uh, just one word about my center. I'm thrilled to be directing this center. Um, we have three missions. One mission is to prevent, cure, I use the word cure, and minimize the disability of individuals with neurodegenerative diseases. We want to minimize the burden of families and their caregivers. I emphasize a couple of things. The rigidity, so, so we diagnose Parkinson's disease clinically, and um, you have to have bradykinesia, you have to have slowness of movement, then one of the following. You need um, uh, cogwheel rigidity, uh, resting tremor, postural instability. Some people use a response to levodopa as an additional feature of diagnosing Parkinson's disease. But this is the main motor features of Parkinson's disease, and it's caused by the loss of these neurons in the brain stem. This is a human, Parkinson's disease, and age match control. You see the black stuff there? It's, it's uh, substantia nigra is, uh, is Latin for a black substance, and these cells die, and that's why you get these symptoms. But, and even myself and other people, we spend too much time working on this system because it's an easy readout for us. But the real problems, we know, we understand that the real problems are many of the non-dopaminergic features. I remember one of the first times I 
gave a talk to patients. And I'm talking about bradykinesia. I'm talking about all this other stuff. And, and they're getting a, sort of the glassy eye look, you know, I can see from the stage. And then I said, oh, and, you know, we're working on something for constipation. And everyone sits up. Now they're interested. And so we have to learn that there are these other issues here that we need to address and we need to get funding to address, especially, and I'm telling you that I am turning my lab over to be a much more cognitive, studying cognitive dysfunction in animal models of Parkinson's disease and eventually in patients with Parkinson's disease. Two things that get patients into nursing homes fall and you break your hip or you get cognitive impairment and that's but those are the issues we need to address uh, going forward. So how am I going to cure Parkinson's disease or try to cure Parkinson's disease? I know what you're all thinking. I know what you're thinking. This is going to take a miracle. Mm -hmm. Now, it is Hanukkah. This is from Passover. But there's Moses parting the Red Sea. And the reason I'm confident we can, we can make great progress and, and have another miracle is because we've already had miracles. So David Marsden said that we have um, two miracles. I'm gonna show you what I think is a third miracle in, in Parkinson's disease today. But the two miracles you really know. The first one here, this is a woman, oops, a woman who, sit, who can't get out of the chair. I didn't show the, for brevity, I'm not showing the whole video. She can't get out of the chair. The doctor asks her to do touch fingers to nose kind of thing. And you can see she's very slow. She's hunched over. And then, um, and as always with Parkinson's, or almost always, it's, she's slower on one side than the other because it starts asymmetrically and progresses um, asymmetrically. And then you give her L-dopa and she can walk. Miracle, she's also a little dystonic in her hands, but that's you know a, poor, a little price to pay for someone turning on to levodopa. First time I ever saw this, it was just amazing. Okay, so um, just amazing. But this is the problem. Eventually, almost everyone gets these, uh, these dyskinesias, sometimes not so troubling as this woman, but um, it's, we, we gotta do something and stem cells can do this. Stem cells will reduce the dyskinesia profile because you're going to be able to lower the dose of levodopa so you don't have uh, these dyskinesias, but still have the anti-Parkinsonian benefit. Now, the other absolute miracle, as many of you know, anyone here have DBS? It's, it's fantastic. And you can pick the right patients. Um, whoops. But I just want to show you that this miracle here deep brain stimulation. This is a person off medication. This is a person um, preoperatively. And he's just awful, just awful. A nurse is gonna to have to come in and catch him because um, he would fall. And so the nurse is gonna put him back. We put these deep brain electrodes into either the subthalamic nucleus or globus pallus, two brain regions that we know are overactive in Parkinson's disease. It's a miracle. And you know what you could do? The patients who, do, who really turn on to levodopa but have these disabling off, um, dyskinesias, that's the perfect patient for this. Other, if you don't get a big bump from levodopa, at least in the on period, not really a, a good patient for this. But these are the two. I'm going to show you a third uh, in a little different part of my talk. And why do we have to do this? I want, we have to do this because if you think COVID is a pandemic, <laughs> Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease are pandemics. And by 2040, there'll be 17.5 million patients with, with Parkinson's disease, 17 point, that's gonna break the bank. And also with Alzheimer's disease, it's gonna be like 25 million. So why are there so many more? So you know, why are we getting so many more patients with no, Parkinson's no, no, no. disease? Well, first of all, I think this makes up a small part of this is the, um, it's an age-related disorder. The older you get, the greater the chance that you get it, people living a little bit longer now. But there's one other kind of interesting thing that I found. Um, so people don't smoke cigarettes anymore. And smoking cigarettes is protective against Parkinson's. Now, do not go home to your family and say, Dr. Cordova said we can smoke cigarettes because it'll prevent us from getting Parkinson's disease. No, that is not the message. 
but I just found it to be an interesting part of why were there so many more patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, so we talked a little bit about, so I showed you the nigral cells um, that are lost, but the real point is it's not really the nigral cells that cause your symptoms. The region, region oh, here, the region right here, this is a, this is a dopamine PET scan. That's all you got to need to know. And you see, this is the region here in a healthy brain that degenerates principally in Parkinson's disease. It's the, the other end of the, of the ele elephant. It's the area called the putamen that loses 80% of its dopamine before you even can get diagnosed because that's how much dopamine has to be lost. And so that also gives us a problem in that we want to intervene early in the disease. Now, early in the disease for a clinician means, oh, that's when I diagnosed them. But early in the disease for a scientist like myself, that's decades beforehand when the brain starts to degenerate. And that's what we really need to get to. I don't know if, if anyone's been following one of the great breakthroughs in Parkinson's disease research, this uh, alpha-synuclein seeding assay. So you can take subjects before they even have symptoms and you can get cerebral spinal fluid and then do a, a, a test in a culture dish, not a culture dish, but do a test. And you can say that person's going to get Parkinson's disease. And that person will not, not get the other atypical Parkinson's diseases like multiple system atrophy or corticobasal degeneration. So this is one of the major uh, pathologies that we we're dealing with here. Um, one of the, so I was doing a gene therapy trial, did all this preclinical work. Everything looked fantastic. And we, uh, I founded a company called Seragene, um, and we were delivering a trophic factor by gene therapy, and it failed. I'm thinking, how could it possibly fail after we did all these preclinical studies? And so we're sitting in a room, and to get into the trial, to get into the trial, you had to have Parkinson's disease for five years, because if you try and take someone early in the disease, earlier than that, you're prone to misdiagnosis, and that really screws up your trial. So, but by the time we have five years of diagnosis, there's no dopamine left for the trophic factor to work on. So that's one feature um, of gene therapy that we have to keep our minds on. I'm gonna spend some time uh, a little later in the talk uh, looking at Lewy pathology, the other classic um, pathology in the brain is this, mis this protein that normally occurs, but it gets misfolded in its shape. It's sort of like your garbage disposal, having all this crap thrown down there and it can't work anymore. That's basically what alpha-synuclein does. And we're doing a lot of gene therapy and other approaches to try and remove this gene therapy. But first, I'm going to talk about cell replacement strategies. So it's not really a very new concept. I think this says 1890 over here. Um, and this is um, I have a bunch of these different slides. Anyway, not important. He says, of course, I had no expectations of being able to restore or abolish function in the operation. But the question of vitality of the brain tissue and the course of its degeneration is a subject for very wide interest. And indeed, but it was really the 1970s when a couple of groups demonstrated using fetal cells, fetal rat cells grafted into Parkinsonian rats that Anders Bjorklund from the University of Lund and his partner Ulla Lindvall from the University of Lund, as well as uh, John Sladek and Barry Hoff from University of Rochester, Barry Hoff from Colorado, Lars also from the Karolinska Institute. They discovered that you can get these cells if you get the right age, early in gestation of a rat, make the lesion in an adult rat, put them into a uh, transplant the cells, and then uh, recovery of function, survival, innervation, all the good things that we needed. So the other thing that's important here is that transplantation of PD is a very rational therapy. The motor PD, remember just motor PD, that's what we're talking about, is associated with relatively specific dopamine neuronal degeneration. We all know that. Dopamine neurons provide 
tonic stimulation. So the dopamine is just being squirted out all the time. It's not burst type of delivery, it's tonic delivery. Um, dopamine replacement therapies provide dramatic clinical benefit like levodopa. So if levodopa works, why shouldn't a transplant work? Then finally, it's the potential to restore normal anatomy and physiology of the transplanted regions. So I went to the University of Rochester um, uh, in 1984 as a postdoctoral fellow. And I walk in, I go, Don, my mentor, I go, Don, I'm here. He was doing a different model, a model of, of just to demonstrate cells can work, not Parkinson's. I go, I'm here, I'm ready to do the transplants. He goes, nope, we're now a Parkinson's lab and you are the monkey guy. <laughs> and totally changed my life. You know, sometimes you gotta be prepared to pivot one way or another. He pivoted for me. And we got to do all these really amazing um, uh, studies. And also I got to meet patients with Parkinson's disease, which is my passion to, to try and help. But this was the era of um, the Bush administrations when field, you couldn't use field resources, or federal resources to do any transplantation using fetuses, human fetuses. And so we tried all these other things, adrenal cells. The adrenal cell sits right above the kidney. And if you take out the uh, one part, not the cortex, the adrenal medulla, the in inner part of the graft, it makes a little bit of dopamine. In animal models, it really didn't do very much. And, but I'll show you what the craziness that occurred uh, during this era in just a second. But there are these other dopamine producing cells. None of them work very well. The only ones that work are fetal dopaminergic progenitors. So you take it out of the fetus or dopaminergic stem cells. And we're gonna talk a bit about both of those in just a minute. i will skip that. So, Transplantation field has a wild history, just craziness. People trying to be famous without having scientific data to back up anything. And it's really just a, um, um, it was awful, just awful. And this is one of the, this is Ignacio Madrazo from Mexico. And so after all these adrenal cells didn't work in, in animal models, he comes around with a paper in New England Journal of Medicine saying that he cures Parkinson's disease with adrenal medullary transplants. And, but it was all fraud. He made it all up. And, and so this really set back the field uh, a very long, uh, long way. Um, so the groups in Lund, the group in Rochester that was part of, um, and Karolinska Institute, and also in, in England and Cambridge, did a whole series of rigorous scientific experiments. And we found that grafted cells in animals can survive in large numbers. They can innervate. That's another very important key part of this. You just don't want the cells to be there. They need to spread their branches out and to innervate uh, the brain. They make normal connections the way a normal brain does. And the reconstruction reverses motor disabilities in a variety of rodent and non-human primate models. Everything that we wanted, this is what we, um, we were able to demonstrate. So I was part of a team led by Warren Alano at Mount Sinai, who was a neurologist. Chris Getz was at Rush, in my hometown. Uh, Tom Freeman uh, was the neurosurgeon, and I was the scientist here when I had hair. <laughs> so you can tell this was quite a long time ago. And so we did all these clinical trials. We did what's called an open label trials first. That means that the patient knew what they got and the evaluator knew what they got. And so it was prone, open label trials are prone to placebo and bias. Um, but then we, we went into what we call double blinded trials. And these were the first, and there were two groups. The um, group by, led by Kurt Fried and Stan Fahn uh, and our group here, my, led by Warren, Chris, myself, and, and Tom. And so we have all this great data. We have this uh, double-blinded clinical trial where the patient didn't know what they got, and the uh, evaluating scientist, the clinician, didn't know what they got. And then both trials failed. And now we're pulling our hair out. Um, so... 
why did so clinical trials are a funny thing in that when you design your trial, you pick what's called a primary endpoint. You say, this is going to be the most important measure. And then you have, you can have a hundred secondary endpoints. And if you don't make your primary endpoint and you make all your secondary endpoints, the trial fails. If you make the primary endpoint and you don't make a hundred secondary endpoints, your trial is still a success. And so the primary endpoints here um, were, um, were not met, but other secondary endpoints, I'm gonna show that to you in just a second. But then something absolutely wild happened and, and it really, in terms of my career, was a signature moment. So I come home one day, this is when I'm in Chicago, just started in Chicago. And on my answer machine, it's blinking. I got a message. And Tom Freeman, the neurosurgeon, calls me up, leaves me a message. He goes, Jeff, one of our patients died from a heart attack 18 months after the transplant. Totally unrelated. What do I do? I said, let me tell you what you don't do. You don't touch that brain. You just get it from the pathologist, put it in some fixative, and send it to me. Because that's what I do. And so we get the brain, I process it, and this is what we saw. And it's absolutely, the, it's the first demonstration in the history of the world that demonstrated that you can have dopamine cells survive transplantation in a patient with Parkinson's disease. And the graft is here. See all this dark cylinder spot? This is one side of the brain, this is the other side of the brain. And what you see here, these are all cells that we put into this patient. And the key point here is not only do we get these cells to survive, but we get them to innervate. This area around the cylinder is all innervation and it's all liberating dopamine. This patient did well um, following uh, transplantation, although it was open label, so prone to placebo. But still, this is the, the, a very exciting signature moment uh, for me and my career but going forward that we were able to demonstrate and publish this in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's how important this, this finding was. But the question always is, well, that's 18 months. I'm planning on living longer than that. How do we know that it's gonna still, you know, those graphs are still gonna be working down the road? Well, no one's done more postmortem analyses of graphs uh, than I have. And my last one is this case. And this case is 16 years post-transplantation. And there's another, my colleague, Patrick Brunda, has a 24 year. And these cells always survive. They always innervate. And they always do the good things that we hope they do for our transplantation trials. So let's go back to the clinical trial for a second. So this is the, the not my study, but the Freed and Fond study. They, had um, a rating scale as their primary endpoint, unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. Many of you probably have gone through it. And then if you take all your patients, it doesn't work. And I'm gonna talk about sham surgery in just a second, because that's sort of a wild concept as well. So, but if you take all patients, they don't do well. Uh, but if you take younger patients, they do. So we still couldn't claim victory here because it's not the primary endpoint. The primary endpoint is all patients. But older patients do bad, young patients do good. So that's one thing. The other thing is this rating scale is your primary endpoint. We still use it. It's still really the most common way to, uh, to evaluate patients in a clinical trial. But the FDA is changing. FDA doesn't really care anymore how fast you could do this. They want to know, can you eat yourself? Can you dress yourself? Can you use the bathroom yourself? They call these functional endpoints. Can you live independently versus dependently? That's what the FDA is changing to. And the Schwab England scale down here, looking at all patients, had significant benefit, and that's a functional endpoint. So if they would have chose this versus that, 
the trial would have been a success and the world of transplantation would have been completely different. For our trial, we had three groups. Um, now down is good, up is bad, okay, on, on this um, screen here. So we had a placebo group that received a sham operation that was unheard of. We put a person into uh, a head frame for neurosurgery, they get an MRI, they go into the operating room, they get anesthesia, they get an incision made, they get a burr hole made in the skull. We don't pass needles now, but still this patient just, they don't know what they got and we break the blind after the trial is over. But um, people say, How, is that ethical? To operate on someone when they have no chance of getting better? Well, but you see here, actually we don't have a placebo. There are other trials in which we have a big placebo effect in Parkinson's disease. Three places you have big um, um, placebo effects, pain, depression, Parkinson's disease. So you gotta protect against that. This is not a therapy, this is a clinical trial, this is an experiment. And I tell you, I lost zero sleep designing this about doing the sham operation. No one got hurt. And what I, the one thing I did lose sleep about is because we're putting a foreign tissue into the brain of a patient, we had to immunosuppress the patient, stop their immune system. And that has some toxicity to it. And that's what I lost sleep about. But at the end of the day, that's just what you have to do. So we had patients getting better between six and nine months. Then we stopped the cyclosporin and then they got worse. If we would have continued the cyclosporin, it's likely that this would have been a significant uh, benefit. But also we did secondary analyses just like the other trial. And so if you took more mild patients, with a UPDRS score of 49 or less, then the transplanted groups did better, significantly better. So in our, and if they were more advanced, then they didn't get better. So we learn from these. We're not doing fetal transplants anymore. No one's doing fetal transplants. There's no need to do it uh, because we have stem cells, but the rules are likely going to apply. We want to choose younger patients and patients with more mild disease and they're most likely to benefit from these uh, transplants. So, uh, yeah, so this is just basically summarizing what I just said. So not that important. So, but someone else can say, to you, say, well, it didn't work. Why are you pressing on? Why are you going further with other cell types when it did not work? by the scientific rules of engagement. Well, other drugs didn't work when they first tested. I didn't realize this, but the first seven st studies that looked at levodopa for Parkinson's disease all failed. Can you imagine if they would have packed it in after you know, a couple of these trials? It would have been disastrous because we still don't have any pharmacological treatment as potent as levodopa, as you all know. So I want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, transplantation of stem cells. What we basically do in our studies, you can take cells from virtually anywhere in the body. You can take skin fibroblasts, uh, you can take fat, and you can make stem, human embryonic stem cells by treating them with what we call the Yamanaka factors down here. The, um, uh, so we take ours from blood. So we just take some blood, we give them the Yamanaka factors, we drive them to being uh, embryonic stem cells, and then we bring them back forward and we make them into nigral cells, not dopaminergic cells, but nigral dopaminergic cells. That's key point, because the cells through genetic, um, through the genes, if they're nigral, they know where to innervate. If they're just dopamine cells, they'll just sit there and do nothing. So we did a variety of studies using our stem cells. Down is good, up is bad. We gave a lesion on one side of the brain for the nigrus rail system. So we have now an asymmetry and rats will rotate um, uh, because the, of this asymmetry. And then we put grafts in to try and normalize the asymmetry um, between the two sides of the brain. And you can see here in a very dose dependent manner, if you have a maximum feasible dose in pink, 
then they get better faster and more robustly. The next dose, high dose, the green slower, but the end, same endpoint, et cetera, et cetera. And this behavioral changes are um, a, a coupled with the amount of cells that survive when we uh, go back into the brain. So a lot of you probably are interested in stem cells. My studies, so we think we have the best cells. I'm not just saying that because I'm a scientific founder of this company. But if you look at the amount of, if you look at the amount of change here and look at the other groups that are in clinical trials or about to go into clinical trials, our cells just outperform. That's, that's just a flat out fact. So, I, and then a very interesting thing happened. The, um, I'm in a movement disorders meeting and the, uh, a patient who had a special kind of Parkinson's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease that had a, a, what we call a Parkin mutation. Basically, this, this is a form of PD that are just like my rats. All they have is a dopamine deficiency. They don't have all the other stuff. And he goes, please, please give me a, um, uh, a transplant. I said, I'm just not ready. It's not time. I, I need FDA approval. We weren't ready at that time to do it. And then I was thinking that really I should do that. I should do this particular population in addition to doing idiopatient with idiopathic disease. And I go to, um, I go to the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And I say, would you be interested in funding a small phase one safety tolerability trial in patients with the Parkinson's mutation? They go, that's really interesting. Let me get back to you. Then COVID hits. The world goes away. And two years later, I get a phone call from the Fox Foundation. He goes, remember that trial you wanted to run? I go, yeah. He goes, if you get us a grant in seven days, we'll give you $3 million to get it started. Now, I'm a generous guy. I'm not going to turn away $3 million because I'm a nice guy. If someone wants to give me $3 million, I'll take $3 million. And um, so that's what we're doing now. But I had a, ran into a problem. And this speaks to one of my joys about being in Arizona. So this all started when I was at Rush. And I had a movement disorder center there. And I had a hospital there. And I had surgeons there. And it was quite easy to do everything. Then I go to ASU, I don't have a hospital, I don't have a medical center, I don't have a surgeon, I don't have anybody. So the first month I came to Arizona, I gave grand rounds everywhere. I went to Barrow, Banner, uh, Mayo, um, up, uh, U of A up in Tucson, and, and blah, blah, blah. And I formed my team. I didn't need to have one university to support me. I could do it here in Phoenix and in Arizona. So the team here is Paul Larson, who's at the University of Arizona. And in fact, he just turned down a job at Barrow and I asked the CEO of Barrow, Mike Lawton, if he would let Paul operate uh, at the Barrow. And he looks at me like, are you crazy? He just turned me down. I said, Michael, it's better for the patients because we don't have to ship them all over Arizona. These are sick people, as you know. He said, fine. So with, uh, Paul's going to operate at the Barrow. Um, surgical site's going to be Barrow. PET scanning will be done at Barrow. And the radio ligands that you need for the PET scanning will be done at Banner. Teammates, it's fantastic. So that's where we're at. Um, I just want to add one other thing. I said there are three miracles that, are, um, that I've seen, that I think, occur in Parkinson's disease. And this is really something quite special. Nope. So uh, has anyone heard about focus ultrasound? Focus ultrasound is basically, it's a lesioning technique. So you put in a person in the focus ultrasound headset in an MRI scan. We put in these micro bubbles at high frequency and it basically makes a lesion or hole in specifically the area you want it to. It's the same areas that we use for deep, deep brain stimulation, but you don't have to go on this anesthesia. You don't have to um, get needle passes, electro passes in your brain. And it's, it's not a non, uh, it's, it's non-incisional. It's not, I'm not gonna say it's non-invasive because we're putting a hole in the brain. And so this is, um, this is an important feature of, um, 
of focus ultrasound. I think this is going to turn out to be the third miracle of Parkinson's disease. I can tell you when I went, so this is the other wonderful thing about being a scientist, you get to travel the world on other people's money. And so I, I go up to Madrid um, uh, to see this man right here, that's Jose Obesa, one of the world leaders in movement disorders and dear friend of mine. And, he, and we're doing work in monkey that I'll just talk about very briefly in just a moment. But he says, we can't get on the scanner yet because we have a patient we need to do first. And so I said, okay. And so he wheels in this woman and she has tremor that is so disabling that they had to do something. So they put her, so they, first of all, they have her draw concentric circles and she can't even do it. It's total waste of time. They put her in the machine. They, they do the focus ultrasound for about 15 minutes. And then she comes out and they, they say, draw the concentric circles. And she's like, this. And then he goes, put her back in 10 more minutes. Make the lesion just a little bit bigger. She comes out. Perfect. And if, and I'm not sure this data still is holding up. And he said to me that um, if, um, uh, if it lasts for six months, it should last forever. And I'm not sure that data is, there's not enough data to make a comment about that. The other thing for uh, using focus ultrasound that I think is going to be incredibly powerful is using low intensity focus ultrasound that opens the blood brain barrier. And you can now get therapeutics that normally you can't get into the brain to get into the brain. And just to give you one little example here, you see these bright spots here? This isn't a therapeutic, but it's a compound called gadolinium. And if you give gadolinium to anyone in this room, you would not see anything. But I opened up the blood-brain barrier here and targeted this region, and we're able to get drugs into the brain using this um, uh, delivery system. It's not sufficient to have the right therapy if you can't deliver it in the proper way. And a lot of these things are just, um, a lot of these things are just, uh, have the, the right therapy, but we just don't have the right way to deliver it so you get the, the target you want engaged. So now I'm going to switch over to a gene therapy approach. And I'm probably going to end there after, after this next section. So Parkinson's, we believe that Parkinson's disease is a prion disorder. And I, I believe it's a prion disorder because just like prions, which is a different disease, it's normally found in the brain, just like alpha synuclein is found in the brain. It then misfolds, just like alpha synuclein misfolds. It spits out a seed, and the next cell that's connected to this cell picks up that seed, and that cell now becomes pathological. That's what a prion does. The difference, the main difference I want for any of you who have been reading about uh, prion diseases, some prion diseases can be spread from person to person. That is not what we're talking about with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease cannot be spread uh, person to person. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, alpha-synuclein and how it spreads. We believe it enters the brain from uh, two, two routes. One is the gut, and then it goes from the gut into the lower part of the brain, and all, or the nose, and it goes into the nose and then spreads uh, forward here. So these transplants, though, provided incredibly important information. This is David Marsden, who I was talking to you about. And I'm presenting the data showing the survival of the fetal transplants. And he comes over to me, goes, Dr. Cordova, can I speak with you? I'd like to ask you a question. That's like Babe Ruth coming to me and going, hey, you want to play catch? I mean, the fact that he knew my name was like one of the most exciting things that happened that day. He's, and he goes, do you think Parkinson's disease will cause the graft to degenerate? And I, I had all this data to, that would pointed to the fact that it would not. And this is the 18 month case that, that I showed you previously. I'm not gonna go through this data, it's not relevant here, but I said to him, I do not think that Parkinson's disease will cause degeneration of the transplant. He's nodding, he's looking at me, and then he goes, it's impossible. <laughs> Parkinson's disease affects those cells. Why are your grafted cells so precious that they would be protected while the host cells wouldn't? So I said, 
what can I tell you? This is the data I have. And then, as I mentioned, I do, no one's done more postmortem cases than I have, but this is a case 10 years following transplant. The, the reason I didn't see it initially because it was just too early. And if you have 10 years following transplant, you have, uh, here's the graph, and you can see these bright structures here. That's the transplanted cells, and they have what we call Lewy pathology, Lewy bodies are in these transplants. Amazing. And so Patrick Brunda and I, so when I first had this, I was going to a meeting in Karolinska and I go to uh, Patrick Brunden and Patrick Brunden um, comes to me and goes, you ever see any Louis bodies in a transplant? And I go, uh-huh. He goes, come here, I wanna show you something. And we went into the room where they um, decide the Nobel prize in medicine. That point of fact has nothing to do with the story. I just like to say that I was in the room where they decided the Nobel Prize in Medicine. And Patrick had the same thing. We ended up publishing this together and, and it was a huge game changer uh, for the, for the um, rest of the field. And basically what people then discover, and this is the work of Virginia Lee who really pioneered this, that if you put this alpha synuclein into a mouse that, um, uh, that overexpressed alpha synuclein normally, it would spread throughout the entire brain. And it was an amazing discovery, but it wouldn't have happened if the transplant work uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, show this. I'm gonna skip that. One other uh, aspect of this alpha synuclein, remember I said you had the seed and it goes from one cell to another and propagates and spreads and spreads and spreads. The, um, the, that formed the basis of all these clinical trials that were trying to grab that seed using um, antibodies and prevent it from spreading. If you can prevent it from spreading, then you know, you, you're starting at an early area of dysfunction and you, don't, you have, never get worse. And this would also affect the non-motor features of Parkinson's disease, not just the motor features. So this approach is extremely powerful. And the one thing I want to tell you about all of these trials, they all failed. However, however, I don't want to be Debbie Downer here. There is hope in this, in this silver lining here because this data that's just been published um, by Roche, this was a poster, you can see it's a crappy picture I took with my cell phone, had a poster. And this is actually a trial that I showed you in the previous slide that didn't succeed because it couldn't meet its primary endpoint. And then they followed these patients for another three to five years. These patients down here never got worse. Well, the patients treated with placebo continued to get worse. This is the first evidence that we could reduce the nuclein and then uh, stabilize disease from, from getting, uh, getting worse. So that's one thing that's uh, exciting for um, the future. We've got to build on this and also need, still need better delivery. But I think that's a very important aspect of the, um, uh, of, of the uh, experiment. So I want to talk a little bit about another um, type of gene therapy. And that's, this is data. All this data I'm going to show you is by my buddy, Chris Bankovich. Um, and this is a trial where patients with Parkinson's disease are going to have four different doses. This is just the, the enrollment at this one time. And, um, and he's delivering far more of this gene therapy than anyone else in the world. He covers 63% of the putamen, the area of our target, using his delivery approach. So that's really very good. So one thing I want you to see here is, first of all, he's getting it into the brain and it's, and it's working. You can see that this is um, from cohort one. Uh, this change here is uh, a 25% increase at six months. Um, cohort two is larger. Cohort three is uh, even larger than that. And you can see the change. So this is at baseline. And you can see the uh, amount of fluoridopa. And you see how it's red here? That's increase in dopamine in the brain. That's how it's signaled here. And uh, so he, this seems to be working. Um, there's safety and tolerability is outstanding here. And, um, and you can see the, the hot spots here. What they do is they, they put the vector in with gadolinium, what I showed you before, 
and you can see it when, during the operation. So you know how much to put it in and you know how to do uh, the targeting. So that is um, pretty exciting. And he's in phase two clinical trials now. Phase two was a blinded efficacy trial. And we wish him great luck because he's terrific. Because it's really quite interesting. They had two different cohorts, a mild cohort and a moderate cohort. And what he's been able to demonstrate here is look at, just look at the red line. That's the motor function here. That mild patients really have a slow progression over time, but moderate patients become mild patients. This is a big change. You know, a lot of times we have these very small changes here and uh, you don't see very much, but this is a big change. This is a clinically relevant to be able to have your UPDRS score in, in half. And when you're not taking medication, that's a huge effect. So we're pretty excited about this going forward. And then the outcomes in terms of off time shrink, good on time increases over time and troublesome dyskinesia basically goes away. So this is a very exciting approach uh, going forward. So I'm gonna just close and just show you one other study. Cause this, I, so the problem I have with this um, uh, antibody approach is it's trying to grab that seed in the extracellular space, the space between two neurons. And that's hard. I think most of the bad synuclein is inside the cell. So we developed nano, we didn't develop nanobodies, nanobodies or intrabodies or intracellular antibodies. So we take a synuclein lowering compound and we attach it to these nanobodies. And what happens is when you have too much in the cell, it, the antibody drags it to a part of the a cell that will destroy it. And that way you never have a lot of alpha synuclein here. Um, and so we make a lesion with, on the brain of these rodents uh, on one side using a, a alpha synuclein toxin. And you can see here, this is an animal that received saline and these are the two intrabodies. And you can see that um, on the side that is responsible for where we made the lesion, it increases. So what you basically do is you take a rodent and you drag it across the tabletop. And a normal rodent will try and ride himself by stepping. And so you can see here that it, on, when they give saline, that there's not much stepping, but there's a lot of stepping when you give these nanobodies. And also there's another motor test here with, with this work as well. And then um, we were able to demonstrate, so this is the synuclein here, and you can see with these nanobodies, it goes away. So uh, we're very excited about this approach. The um, part of the problem taking this to the clinic is that our intrabody has both mouse components and human components, and the FDA will never allow you to do that. So we had to go back and humanize our antibodies. And so we have a fully human intrabody now. And you can see here, see how much green is here and how it's lowered here and here. This is the mouse one, and this is the fully humanized one. And so we, we believe that this is now gonna be useful for clinical trials. And then um, uh, it does everything that we, we needed to do. The details here aren't that important. And we are excited about um, forming a company around this and using these intrabodies and gene delivery to reduce the toxin that's most important in the brain. I had the honor and great privilege to give the keynote lecture at the Spanish Royal Academy of Medicine. You can imagine what a thrill th that would be. And, and I was giving what's called the Cajal Lecture. Ramon y Cajal in 1903 won the Nobel Prize. He's the only Spaniard to ever win a Nobel Prize. And he is regarded as the father of neuroanatomy. And they have a fantastic museum that they allowed me to go see. And in his writings, Cajal, said, you don't see regeneration of the brain. And so now I'm trying to give this Cajal lecture and it's not just neuroscientists, it's chemists, it's physicists, you know, so I wanted to make it something that they could relate to that would also honor Cajal. 
So what I did was I have Cajal's autobiography on my uh, bookshelf and I'm starting to go through it looking for a, a nice quote to use. And then I realized this is the stupidest way to try and get a quote ever. So I just went to my computer. I Googled quotes by Cajal and 20 quotes came up. And, and this is the one that really touched my heart. I know if Cajal would see the cell replacement therapy and you know, see the regeneration that we can do with gene therapies, I know he would love it because this is what he said. Nothing inspires more reverence and awe in me than an old man who knows how to change his mind. That shows you what a great scientist he was. He wasn't inflexible in his thoughts and he led the, had the data lead him to the next step at all times. So I think he would have been thrilled to this. I can tell you, just to summarize, first of all, this is my group. I want to point out this gentleman right here. This is Paul Coleman. He's a giant in the area of Alzheimer's disease and aging. He's 95 years old. He's my postdoc now. Because when I came to Arizona State, he was working in my center. And he goes to me, you know, and he was like my advisor when I was at Rochester uh, as a postdoc. So that's how far we knew each other. And so I just love the fact he comes to work. He wrote three papers this year. He put out two grants this year. And he's just an absolute giant. And these are, these are my kids uh, that do really all the work here. And just to summarize, I have bright, I believe, bright future for stem cell transplantation. The science has been set in fetal transplants. And we know what we can do better and I think I have tremendous confidence that we will do better uh, and patients will have great benefit uh, from stem cell transplants. When I showed you that slide where I compared other groups, uh, Lorenz Studer at Blue Rock and uh, Jun Takahashi uh, in Japan already have clinical trials ongoing. Uh, Marlon Palmer does his, his Lind as well. So keep an eye out. Right now they're into these phase one trials and I, you know, it's nice to get in early, but it's not going to be an efficacy trial. So just keep an eye out for, for these uh, clinical trials. They're all really good scientists and, and are rigorous and mature about the way they go about things. With gene therapy, there are a lot of different approaches here. I think gene therapy um, to reduce toxic proteins like alpha-synuclein can have a major impact on the major symptoms that we need to address. And right now we don't have those therapies for those major symptoms. Um, that's where I'm gonna be dedicating my, my lab to over the next five to 10 years. We're gonna change from just being a motor Parkinson's lab, but a cognitive Parkinson's lab. And I think that that's incredibly important. 